In this tutorial we're going to look at some preferences. Now if you're on a Mac it'll be under your Premiere Pro options but for PC it's under Edit and then right at the bottom Preferences. Now I'm going to click on General and we're going to work through just a few of them. I'm not going to go through all of them but it's worth showing you that you've got Video Transition Default so that's 25 frames. For me I'm on a PAL machine so that's 25 frames. That's one second for the actual duration and you can see that the audio transition is also for one second. So if you're working with NTSC footage, you might be at 29.97 or 30 frames, and that'll still be a second. The still image default duration is for 125 frames for, bear in mind I'm on a PAL system, so that's 5 seconds. So when I bring in a still image, I import a still image, that still image, when dragged or moved to my timeline, will play for 5 seconds. Sometimes you want to bring in a whole bunch of still images and you want them just to be a much shorter duration. Well, if you change it in the preferences before you import it into your project panel, and that's important, then it'll come in at the new value. For example, at the moment I have some images, I'm just going to click OK, and you see I've got some pictures here. So if I take Bamber Castle and I was to drop it on my timeline here, You'll see there's Bamber Castle and it plays for five seconds. I'm just going to zoom in a bit with this zoom bar. So there you go. We're going to play for five seconds. Now, if I go to Edit, Preferences, General, or Premiere Pro Preferences, General, and I change this to 25 frames, and I click OK. Now I look for my Bamber Castle. I'm going to bring in Bamber Castle again, so Command I or Control I to get my Explorer window, and there's Bamber Castle, bring it in again. But this time Bamber Castle is not inside my Pix folder, so we can see which is which. And I take that and put that on the timeline. You'll see that the new version is just a second long, whereas the previous version that was imported under the old settings is five seconds long. And there's another option which is quite important along these lines. You'll see that at the moment, neither of these images really fit the screen. If I double click the item here to open it in my source panel, you'll see that that is the full size of the actual image. And yet, in Premiere Pro, in my actual program monitor over here, you'll see that I'm only seeing a part of the image. So if I go back to my Preferences, Edit Preferences, General, you'll see that as well as the time option up here, and I'm going to take that back to 125 frames, you'll see that I've got another option further down, just here, which says Default Scale to Frame Size. If I click the Default Scale to Frame Size, what it's going to do is it's going to try and make the image fit inside the frame of my sequence. Now my sequence is a particular size and so now it's going to try and take this much bigger image and fit it inside because I've done the default scale to frame size. However, it's not going to affect anything that's imported so far. So if I click OK and I was to pull in another version of the Bamber Castle that I imported before, it's exactly the same. It's one second and if I go over it, it doesn't fit. I need to re-import it, so Control or Command I, and go back to Bamberg Castle yet again and open it. And there you go, we see we've got a new version. I assume it's the bottom one. Let's drag that in and have a look. Yep, that's the new one. Again, it's back to five seconds, but if I go over it, you'll see that it's fitting. Now, when it says fit, what's actually happening is it's taken one of the dimensions and made sure they fit whereas the other dimensions, in other words, the edges, do not quite fit. So we might need to scale up the image to get the exact bit that we want at another point. And we'll be looking at the whole issue of moving things around and scaling them and rotating them and all the rest of it in another section of this training series. But the thing to realize at the moment is if you make a change in your preferences, it's not going to affect what you've already brought in. It's going to affect what you bring in from then on. So I'm going to go back to my preferences edit preferences and we can see that there's a few more bits and pieces that we can look through just down here by the way are the um, operations of the bins that we looked at in a previous tutorial you can actually change them if you want to but as I said before I'm not going to go through everything I'm actually going to go down to the next one which says appearance 
and appearance is actually the brightness or the darkness of the interface. So if you grab this, you can make the whole thing really dark, or you can make the whole thing really light, which hurts my eyes, and click default, and it takes you back to the CS6 default, which is actually different to the CS5 default. If I very quickly show you CS5 5.5, edit preferences, and we go to appearance, you'll see that it's a lot, lot lighter. That's the default setting there. So we need to be down here, which is roughly where the CS6 settings are. Okay, so back to CS6, back to its preferences. So it depends how you want to work, but it's generally speaking easier on the eye if your interface is darker. Then you can really concentrate on the media and you're not distracted by what's going on in the timeline or elsewhere. So I'm going to work with default settings for now. On the next tab, audio, there's only one thing that I'd really like to show you is these options here. One says play audio while scrubbing. And what that means is that while you pull the playhead along with your mouse, you will hear some audio feedback. Now that can be very great at some times and other times it just becomes a pain in the neck. So it's just worth knowing that you can actually disable that at this point. So if you don't want to hear audio while you're pulling the playhead around, you can disable it here. The next one below is mute input during timeline recording. Now I like to check that one because sometimes I record directly into Premiere Pro because Premiere Pro does have a full feature recording studio built in and I quite often put my narration straight into Premiere Pro and I don't want it to come through my speakers because that way I get a feedback loop. So I like to tick mute input during timeline recording so that when I record it's not actually going to feed back. Audio hardware, if you don't have additional hardware set up then you will have Premiere Pro WDM sound which is the only setting you've got. I have an external device that I can also fit on my particular one. If you have them, they will show here. You can select them and then go to the SEO settings. SEO settings, you won't have SEO settings on a Mac. You'll have something different. But it's basically about choosing what you're going to use for input and what you're going to use for output. So for input, we might choose the integrated one or we might choose an external mic. And you can actually select them here. And output, are you going to listen through your speakers or some other way? So... You'll have different settings to ASIO settings in a Mac, but the same function. It's really choosing what you're going to use for input and output. After audio hardware, I like to look at auto save. Now, it's very important to remember that even though Premiere Pro CS5 and above has been a lot more stable than previous releases, it still crashes every now and then. And when it crashes, if you haven't saved a backup, then you're going to lose all your work. So we like to have automatic save projects enabled. Then you can choose the amount of time between automatic backup saves. So at the moment, it's 20 minutes till every save, and I've got a maximum of five saves. So that's 100 minutes before the first one will start being written over. Okay, so automatically save projects, yes. You can have as many projects really as you like in here, and you can set this time to bigger or smaller. The only thing to say is sometimes when there's an auto save going on, it disables other functions. So do set up autosave and have as many versions as you like. It sets up a folder in your project folder which has got autosaves in so that if you have a crash, you can go and open up one last autosave and go from there. The only thing I would say though is that if you do save your project and then you go away for lunch and uh, you have an extra long lunch, uh, have an extra long liquid lunch or something like that and you've come back and you've been more than 100 minutes, then the last autosave will have been written over and you won't be able to go backwards in your work. You'll only have five of exactly the same thing saved through. But saving a project and setting up projects for autosave is very important. In fact, setting up projects, saving is something we will be covering a bit later on. The other ones to look at down here, you can change the color of individual items and then map them to different footage items. So you can see on my timeline down here, I've got an audio file, a video file and a picture. And if we go to defaults, you can see that audio is Caribbean, stills are lavender, and video is violet. And you can change those colors here. So if I go to where it says Caribbean here, for instance, I can change it. And if I wanted to, I could make it a much stronger color, something like that, if I wanted, and click OK. And then that will actually update the different colors that I've got. Or I can take my lavender, and I can turn it into bright red if I wanted click OK. It won't update until I click OK, but when I have updated, you'll see that those bits and pieces have actually updated. 
and I'm going to go back to my preferences and go back to label colors and take that back a bit more to lavender at least slightly more where it was before okay so you can change those label colors it can actually make items a lot easier to see on the timeline which can be quite useful if I go to media next it says here you've got an option to save media cache files next to the originals where possible or you can save them in a specific location now what is a media cache file there are certain types of media that when they come in are very quickly cached so that you've got much better performance they include things like AVC HD HDV with Premiere Pro generally speaking footage is brought in and it plays straight on the timeline but occasionally some files do need caching just because of the nature of the codec that's used the, the way that the information is if you like squashed down so that you get maximum information in smallest size files and to play those back quickly and easily just occasionally they're going to be cached usually it's happening with audio but there are a few codecs that are affected so we can decide either to save the next to the originals or in a separate cache I tend to save mine in a separate cache and you do have a database which basically tells Premiere Pro what cache file should be linked to what original file so it's just a database and you can clean that if you like if things get built up okay after that memory is another important one to go for now this tells you how much RAM you've actually got in your machine and it says RAM reserved for other applications it's really important to reserve RAM for other applications because those applications will effectively start trying to steal the RAM that you've got allocated to Premiere Pro and slow the whole system down if you don't leave enough here to be able to allow those other programs to run so if you've got 8 gig installed I've allowed 2 gigs to run other applications if you don't allow enough RAM here basically you'll slow your system down and if your system is becoming very slow then you can actually allow more RAM for other applications and regarding optimized rendering for generally speaking leave this at performance unless you start getting memory problems and then you can actually optimize it for memory if you start getting memory problems and then all the other bits and pieces are pretty much standard we've got the playback that's the Adobe player which is the only option you've got unless you've got some external hardware set up okay so I'm gonna click OK those are my preferences and in the next tutorial we'll have a quick look at these new items that we can actually add to our video down here.